Good morning, this is your Stat Sensei, Mr. Spensei, and this is the extra credit video for extra credit B, and this will have extra credit test B, and we'll be doing problems one through nine in this video. There will be four videos that cover this, um, this particular extra credit event. Uh, you will need to do all of them to receive the extra credit points. The statistics below provide a summary of the distribution of heights and inches for a simple random sample of 200 young children, all right? So we have 200 children. We have a mean of 46, a median of 45, a standard deviation of three, a first quartile of 43, and a third quartile of 48. So the fact that we're talking about quartiles and medians, I decided to draw a box plot, all right? So... There's my first quartile, there's my third quartile, there's my median. And I know that in each section, I have 25% of my data. So it says about 100 children in the sample have heights that are. Well, basically, we have a sample of 200. So 200 times 0.5 equals 100. So that would be about 100. This would be about 100. And this would be about 100. All right, where this is my min. And this is my max. So less than 43. No, we'd expect about, about 25 to be there. Less than 48. Well, less than 48. 48 is way up here. So that's about 75%. So that's way too much. So these go on. Between 43 and 48. Well, sure enough, that's about 50%. And 50% of 200 equals 100. So I'm liking C. For number one, which of the uh, following situations would it be most difficult to use a census? Well, remember, a census is difficult when we have a very large population or a population that's difficult to get a hold of. Small populations, uh, a census works well. If I want to count everyone in my classroom, not a big deal because I know how many students I know their averages. So determine what proportion of lice and bicycles on a university have lights. Uh, I don't know. I, that sounds a little bit difficult because it could be a large university and bicycles move around, but maybe. To determine what proportion of students in a high school support wearing uniforms. That one I'm pretty sure is wrong. I'm pretty sure that one's easy. I'm pretty sure this one's easy to do because I could just put a poll out and have the, the students fill that out. To determine what proportion of registered students enrolled in the college are employed more than 20 hours. Once again, I could probably do a poll. That's probably reasonably easy. To determine the proportion of single family dwellings in a small town that have a two car garage. That's a little bit of a pain, but I do have access. So I don't know. We'll put a question mark. Again, I'm not sure yet. I'm looking for one that might be obvious. To determine what proportion of fish in a lake in Lake Michigan are bass. Wow, that would be difficult because one, I'd have to count all the fish in the lake. And the only way to do that would be to drain the lake. So I'm saying that's probably the hardest one. That's probably the most difficult. So I'm gonna go with E on this one. The distribution of the diameters of a particular variety of orange is normally distributed with a standard deviation of 0.3. How does the diameter of an orange at the 67th percentile compare with the mean diameter? Well, I know that if it's the 67th percentile, halfway is 50. So 67 is going to be above. So that right there tells me I'm getting rid of A and B because both of those are below. Huh. I don't have everything I need to know. So I write down Z equals X minus mu because they told me it was normally distributed. Well. I don't know X, I don't know mu. I know this standard deviation is 0.3. And because they give me a percentile, I can go to inverse norm and get a Z score. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. At least I hope I am. So second quit, second bars, inverse norm, 0.67, mean is zero standard deviation of one because I'm just looking for a Z score and all Z scores are zero, 01, and I end up getting 0.4399. Great.
So the nice thing is we now have our Z-score, and they're tricky. They already put this value in there, but we need to solve for this difference. So when I multiply both sides by 0.3, I end up getting 0.1319. So 0.1319 equals X minus mu. So we need to be 0.1319 above the mean. And we know it's above because we drew this graph here and 67% is above halfway. So in this case, our answer is C. All right. So number three is C. Moving on. Good old Betty and Sally. As lab partners, Sally and Betty collected data for a significance test. Both calculated the same Z statistic. But Sally found the results were significant at the alpha equals 0.05, while Betty found that the results were not. When checking their results, the women found that the only difference in their work was that Sally used a two-tailed test. Well, Sally used a two-tailed test, and we have alpha, equal point, um, alpha equals 0.05. That means in each tail. Alpha is the area in the each tail. Alpha is the area in the tails. So 0 0.05 divided by two is 0 0.025. So let's find out what her z scores must have been. So second vars, inverse norm, and 0 0.025 mean zero standard deviation one. We end up getting z score of negative 1.96. So she could have either had a negative 1.96 or 1.96 because we don't know if it was positive or negative. So let's look to see what happens. Well, on the upper end, I need values greater than 1.96. And I look, and they're on the upper end, 1.34 is not high enough. That's not high enough. That's not high enough. So that gets rid of every single one of those answers because none of those values were rejected. On the lower end, negative 1.98. Well, guess what? That's in the rejection zone but negative 1.69 is not. So the only possible answer at this point is A. So we know the answer to four is A, but why didn't that work for Betty who ran a one-tail test and got the exact same statistic? So maybe she still got a negative 1.98. We know that her area is larger at 0.05, and if I do a second VARS inverse norm of 0.05, second VARS inverse norm, 0.05, I end up getting, oops, second VARS, inverse norm, 0.05, not zero. I end up getting negative 1.64. Anyway, so this would be my Z score. Well, she has a negative 1.98, and you're like, well, that's in a rejection zone. But the answer is, well, what if she ran an upper tail test? In which case, this would be her rejection zone. And because that line is not in that zone, she would not have rejected. So that's how that happened. But the easiest way to isolate it is to work on Sally's part. Okay. Number four is a pretty challenging problem, in my opinion. Number five, a safety group claims that the mean speed of drivers on the highway exceeds the posted speed limit of 65 miles an hour. To investigate the safety's claim, which of the following is appropriate? And they start saying hypothesis. It's like, oh, well, huh, well, HO, mu equals 65. MPH, HA, well, we're worried about it being greater than. Remember, our null hypothesis is always and equal to. All right, so this is always going to be equal, so this must have been the greater than because that's what we're concerned about. The null hypothesis is that the mean of the drive that the mean is less than 65. No, the null is that it's equal, so that one's false. The null hypothesis is the mean of the drivers is greater than 65. No, it's always equal for AP statistic. The alternative hypothesis is the mean of the drivers is greater than 65. Well, there's our alternative. It's greater. That's our answer. So the answer number five is C. A fair coin is to be flipped five times. The first four flips land heads up. What's the probability of heads on the next flip of the coin? 
well. Remember, if it's a fair coin, all the flips are independent. So what's the probability of getting a heads? The probability of getting a head is one half. All right? So, um, on the, number six, we're looking at, hey, the probability of the next one, well, it doesn't matter what the first four were, the probability of getting a heads on the next one is also B because it's um, the, the very next flip. Now, if they had asked us a different question, they said, what's the probability of flipping it five times and getting exactly one head? That would have been this binomial, and people are going to be inclined to fill out the binomial. This would be the geometric. The first head occurs on the um, fifth trial. But what they asked is, we flipped it four times. We got heads. What's the probability the next one is heads? Well, again, the coin is fair. It doesn't have a memory. So six will be one half, which is B. All right? Okay, number seven. The stem plot clear uh, below shows the yearly earnings uh, before stock for two different companies over a 16-year period. Which of the following statements is true? Well, let's look at this one first off. So we have zero, one, and two. And I'm just going to look at that and go, you know what? I got a bunch here, a bunch in the middle. So this one is reasonably mound-shaped and centered at about one. When I look at this one, go, well, zero, one, two, three. I have a lot at the beginning and then a few at the top. So this one appears to be skewed right, and that's going to be important. So here the mean and median should be about the same and about here. Over here, we're skewed to the right, which means our mean, our average, will be above our median. So our mean will be greater than the median. All right. So when I look at this, the median of company A is less than the median of company B. And I'm like, you know what? Without doing any work, this median is going to be here. This median may be here, but probably a little bit above. So I don't think that's the answer. I'm going to keep going. All right. That doesn't look too good just because of the shape. The range of the earnings of company A is less than the range of company B. Well, the range is largest minus smallest. So in this case, we'd be looking at 373 minus 126. So let's check that out. 373 minus 126. We end up getting a range of about 247. So our R over here is about 247. When I come over here, my largest value is 229. And my smallest value is 58. So 229 minus 58. It's like, no, that's 171. The range of company A is less than B. That's false. That's clearly wrong. The third quartile of company A is smaller than the third quartile of company B. That's going to require some work. I could put all the data in the calculator and figure it out. But it's skewed. So if it's skewed, that's probably false. But once again, since I didn't do the work, I'm going to put a question mark and keep going and see if I can find an easier answer. The mean of the earnings of company A is greater than the mean of the earnings of company B. Well, this is skewed, so the mean and the median, I mean, this one is normal, so the mean and the median should be about the same spot. So the mean and the median are going to be somewhere over here. This one is skewed right, so my mean is going to be above the median, which means it's going to be start, the very first number should probably start with a 2. This one's going to start with a one. This was starting with a two. This is skewed to the right. Mean is greater than the median. Here, the mean is approximately equal to the median. So right there, I'm pretty confident it's D without doing a whole lot of calculations. All right. So 7D. Number eight. Let X represent the random variables whose distribution is normal with a mean of 100. So this is really key that they told me it's normal, so I can use normal probabilities with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, which is the following is equivalent to the probability that X is greater than 15. So I went ahead and drew the picture, all right? So 
And not that I have to do this at this time, but I'm going to. I'm going to do a norm CDF. Just remind you about norm CDF because we haven't used it in a while. So the second var is norm CDF. And my lower bound, by the way, let's see if I can adjust this just a bit. Nope, too much. I don't know that that's any better. But my lower bound is 115, 115. Upper bound, 9 carat, 9, 9. My mean was 100. And they told me my standard deviation was 10. All right? And I calculate, and I end up getting this area right here is 0.0668. So this area here is 0 0.0668. Well, they're asking me to find a probability that's the same as that. Well, this area is stuck in the tail. And if it's normal, it's symmetric. So I should be able to have the same area down here. Well, the distance here is 15. So I should be able to go, all right, let's try this area out. So let's check that out real quickly and see what happens. So second bars inverse norm, oops, second bar is norm CDF, even I haven't been there that often recently, so negative 9 carat 9, 9, and I'm upper bound to 85, mean of 100, and a standard deviation of 10. Hey, 0 0.0668. So I actually get the same value. So this was my test. And so basically, we're looking for anything less than 85. So the probability that x is less than 85 equals the probability that x is greater than 115. So probability of x is less than 85 is c. So our answer for number 8 is c. All right, last one for this video. A television news editor would like to know how local registered voters would respond to the question, are you in favor of school bond measure that will be voted on in an upcoming special election? A television survey is conducted during a break in the evening news by listing, uh, by listing two telephone numbers side by side on the screen, one for viewers to call if they approve of the bond and the uh, bond measure and the other if they disapprove. The survey method could produce biased results for a number of reasons. Which of the following is the most obvious reason? Well, first off, you know, we have people who are watching the news, and not everyone does watch the news. And no one knows if they're watching that channel. But the biggest thing here is they self-selected. And the people who are going to vote are, this is going to be a case of voluntary response bias because we didn't randomly select them. Since we didn't randomly select them, voluntary response bias, and the people who feel most strongly are likely to vote. So it uses a stratified sample. No, it didn't. There was no stratification. There was no randomization. You just called in if you felt like it. People who feel strongly about the issue are more likely to respond. Yes, this is voluntary response bias. Only those who care. Um, will be the ones that vote and the ones and those that feel strongly one way or the other are the most likely to vote. So for number nine, we have B. All right, that's the end of this video. I hope to see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.